Hey, welcome. We're so glad you're joining us here at One and All. My name is Heather. I'm here with my friend Drew today, and I especially want to welcome you if you are new, if you are just checking us out maybe for the first time, or if you've been here for a couple weeks, we would love to connect with you, um, see how we can be praying for you, send some fun stuff your way. You can help us connect with you by scanning the QR code that you might see on the screen right here or on the seat back in front of you sometime today during service. Yeah, and if you are watching online and you are new, we would love to reach out to you. If you can go to oneandall.church slash new, and we would love to give you additional resources uh, and send you all the things. Yeah, and speaking of all the things, there are so many things (laughs) online. (laughs) Uh, Drew and I work in that digital space, and we really work hard at making sure we can take your experience beyond the weekend or beyond this video if you're watching online and help you grow throughout the week too. So what kind of stuff do we have? Yeah, we have a lot. The first thing is we have the daily, which Mm -hmm. is a short daily devotional that you can either listen to on an audio platform or you can download our One and All app and watch the video of it, which takes you to a whole reflection page and a prayer page. And I believe that this is something that just helps the believer, helps somebody who's new to their faith, just like walk with Jesus daily. Um, And then from there, we also have this thing on YouTube called Conversations, where we get to sit with the speaker and just talk and dive deep uh, from the sermon. I believe this is just a great resource, especially when a lot of people, we've heard so much feedback Mm -hmm. saying like, hey, we'd love to know more about what Jeff is talking about because sometimes it can (laughs) go over our heads. Yeah, like explain it. Break it down (laughs) for me. (laughs) Exactly. And so that's a great space for a weekend content, Mm -hmm. uh, not weekend content, weekday content. Um, just to dive more deeper into the sermons. And so, yeah, yeah. and there's so much more that we're planning to yes. do with YouTube. <laughs> which so I'm many really ideas. Excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes too many ideas. Yes. Yeah, but I'd say for now, <laughs> I'd say for now, make sure you're subscribed on our YouTube channel yes. so you can see all the fun stuff we're putting out. And make sure you have the one on all app and you check yeah. in there regularly. We're posting stuff all the time. There's, ser- there's sermon notes. Um, yeah. There's uh, events that are coming up. Mm-hmm. It's a great place just to make sure you're seeing all the stuff that we're working on here at One and All <laughs> yeah. to help you stay connected and to help you grow. And now we are in our first week of our brand new series, How to Fix Your Marriage. I want to encourage you to bring out your Bibles, pull up your One and All app so you can follow along on the sermon notes. And now the moment we waited seven days for. Welcome, welcome to, to One, One and All. all. Amen. Welcome to church. Let's stand and worship together. Jesus deserves everything we have. He's worthy of all the glory, all the honor. Our new beginnings are only found in Him, amen? He deserves all of our attention. Hallelujah. Let's give Him glory. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm
Lord Jesus, we want you more than ever before. We long for you as the deer longs to the water. We thirst for you, our soul longs for you, clings to you. We need you. Come and be with us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen. Why would you please stay standing? I wanted to celebrate something that God has done in our church. Uh, we love young adults at our church and God has been, yes, and, and God, God has been moving tremendously and so I want to introduce some special people that God has put a call in their lives and they're going to be serving here on the Sandimas campus as in special roles. Marissa, Natalie, would you please come forward? Thank you. Yeah, we're missing one. His name is Alan. He's not feeling well today, but... He's going to be here, but I want to introduce to you these special ladies. Marissa is going to be, as of, as of April 8th, she is the young adults pastor and also, amen, and also associate Sandimas campus pastor helping me here with a pastoral role at Sandimas campus. Then we've got Natalie who, yeah, you guys know Natalie, yes. She's our worship pastor here at St. Dimas campus and also helping shepherd a lot of uh, the other worship leaders on their campuses. So God has done a great thing for us and Alan is going to be our youth pastor here at the St. Dimas campus, Alan Walters. Yep. So can you stretch out your hands and let's pray for them as they begin this journey, as we support them. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these amazing young adults that you've brought to our church. We pray that you continue to use them for your glory. We pray for humility as they move into this role that God, they will serve you and serve the people of this church with great humility and integrity and with skillful hands, God. Lord, we pray that the anointing of God will be upon them and that they'll help shepherd your flock, your flock to the best of their ability. And so we lift them up to you. We give them to you. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. And amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Please be seated. Hey, who is happy to be here today? Good. Amen. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. We're so glad that you are able to join us. My name is Michael Chisaka. I get the honor of serving you here as the campus pastor at the St. Dimas campus. I love you guys. You guys are the best. If you're new, <laughs> we want to help you get connected here at One Oak Church. And one of the things we do when we begin a new series, we do this thing called Meet the Pastor. I am going to be in the fireside room right after service for about 10 minutes. I'd love to meet anyone who's been here for this is your first time, your second time, your third, your fourth time. I'd love to meet you, answer any questions you may have. Another way you can get connected is by scanning the QR code and sit back in front of you, downloading the One All app, and there you can find more about who we are, but also follow along when the message starts in a few moments. Are you ready for the sermon? Our new series? All right, all right, here we go. Let's roll. series how to fix your marriage I have no idea thank you for coming no, 
<laughs> How to fix your marriage. Oh boy. Are we going to have some fun? Uh, I'm in Genesis 29. It's a passage that we've looked at before, but like I've said, when you go to the scripture and you have narratives, it depends on where, what season you are of life. It's like a precious jewel. When you turn it, it reflects light differently and depend, depending on what season or what topic it speaks truths into your life. Now, before we approach this series, I want to tell you something. I'm going to ask you to remember three things. Well, for, uh, let's make it four. First thing is this. If you think that if you're single, this doesn't affect, uh, impact you, or if you have been married but you're no longer married, this doesn't impact you, marriage series are the best series ever to help you identify and understand what the love of God is really like. So if, if you're thinking, you know what, this doesn't apply to me, you're, you're, no, it does. You're going to find truths all along the way. Second is we're going to cover a lot of territory in just a few amount of weeks. So I'm going to ask you to be patient because during sermons like this in series, you'll be sitting there thinking, yeah, but what about this? So just be patient. We'll get to it. Third, it covers both singleness and marriage. So be attentive. So it covers a lot of territory. Be patient. It covers singleness and marriage. Be attentive. Uh, after all, we have a saying uh, as, as uh, pastors who have employees, we say the best time to fire someone is not to hire them. The best time to divorce someone is not to marry them. So you with me? So a lot of this is going to help you if you're single think, wow, I never asked those questions. I've never even thought about that. And if you're married and you didn't ask those questions, then you have to say, okay, now what do I do from here? This series will cover all of that. Third or fourth question, we're going to move from the big ideas, the overarching principles, because until you understand the origin, the meaning, the purpose of marriage, there's no way you can go into it with your eyes wide open and have a successful relationship. Now, other good news, at the end of this series, we're actually going to do a Q&A. I'm going to go over to the fireside room for anybody who says, well, you didn't cover that. And I got a question about this. So after the final message, uh, on a Sunday afternoon or evening, you'll hear more about this. I'm going to go over there and we're going to have Q&A because I want to make sure I'm able to cover everything, okay? So how to fix your marriage, starting with Genesis 29. By the way, based on the current trend, this is a much needed series. Forbes advisor just came out with the marriage and divorce stats in 2024. So this covers the last two decades. So we're up to date now. The average length of a marriage, would you like to guess? What is the average length of a marriage? Eight years. Eight years. That's exactly right. You've done your homework. It's an all-time low. And maybe that's why 90% of the jokes that come across my desk from other pastors have to do with marriage. Because if you're not laughing, you're going to be crying all the time. I had a bunch of them, but because of time, one of the stories I got was a bank robber comes in to rob a bank and... There's husbands and wives in line ready to deposit or I guess to withdraw whatever they're going to do. And the guy throws the gun up in the air and as he does, his mask falls down and he saw this one guy in line. He went over to him and he said, hey, did you see that? And he said, no, but my wife did. And that's the kind of, those are the kind of jokes that we usually get. Okay. Uh, I think, I think that kind of describes that marriage can be so wonderful, but it can also, let's, can we be honest, a pain in the backside. It can. Uh, love is like an onion. You taste it with delight. But when it's gone, you wonder whatever made you bite. Love is a funny thing. Just like a lizard, it curls up around your heart and crawls into your gizzard. <laughs> love is swell. It's so enticing. It's orange gels. It's strawberry icing. It's chocolate mousse. It's roasted goose. It's ham on rye. It's banana pie. Love is all good things without question. In other words, it's indigestion. <laughs> the irony of marriage. Okay, as I as a pastor try to access or summarize would be a better word, the last few decades, in my marriage counseling or helping young couples who are brand new into the marriage or even people who've been married for years and years, I would have to tell you that I believe that the large part, the, a large part of the reason that marriages are only lasting on average eight years can be summed up in two words, unrealistic expectations. Man, when you start that, oh, what we expect from each other is just unrealistic. When I did this series a few years ago, not these exact sermons, but when I did a marriage series a few years ago, I reminded us that the James Bond movie, Skyfall, which I think was the worst Bond movie of all, 
But evidently I was, I was wrong because it had a global revenue of over $1.1 billion. $1.1 billion. Twice as many men go to bomb movies as women. 72% of women who do go to bomb movies didn't want to go. So why do they go? Because they're dragged along by a husband or boyfriend. But the reason we men like bomb movies is because it's a man's dream to have a magic credit card, endless adventure. He's always traveling first class all around the world. Sure, he gets shot at a lot, but the bullets never hit him. <laughs> and he's got all the women you could ever want in his mind lining up at his door. The problem is, though, it's not real. So if you go into your relationship, it says James Bond, you're probably going to come out as Johnny English, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but wait a minute, men have gotten a bad rap on this because it's not only men that go in, it's not only the men that go in with unrealistic expectations, is it? You remember my favorite scene in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, and those of you who don't know Groundhog Day, you need to watch it. It's a cult classic. But uh, Bill Murray sitting on the table, with the table, behind the table, with Andy McDowell, and he's trying to court her, and he says, who's your... What kind of man are you looking for? Who's your perfect man? The list she gives is laughable. She says, first of all, he's too humble to know he's perfect. He's intelligent, supportive, and funny. He's romantic and courageous. He's got a good body, but he doesn't have to look in the mirror every two minutes. He's kind, sensitive, and gentle. By the way, let me tell you, if I had a good body, I'd be looking in the mirror every two minutes. <laughs> he is not afraid to cry in front of me. He likes animals and children. He will change poopy diapers. And oh, he plays an instrument and loves his mother. And I love, I love Bill Murray's response. This is a man we're talking about, isn't it? A man. <laughs> now, the article I mentioned in Forbes gives some other stats that seem contradictory. It says the average marriage lasts eight years, yet the divorce rate in America hit a 40-year low in 2020 and 21. How does that work? I had a New Zealand friend of mine one time say, to me, and he, he wasn't a believer. He said, you know what? We don't really need God because the number of divorces is lower in our country than any other country. And I reminded him, well, number one, if you're talking about small numbers, because there's only 4 million people in this entire country. And two, if you're talking about the divorce rate, well, of course it's not large because nobody gets married in New Zealand anymore. It's de facto unions. And when a de facto union splits up, it's not counted as a marriage and divorce. So of course you have a low divorce rate because people just live together. In America, the divorce rate is also misleading because they don't tell you that although the Gen Z's seek marriage, did you know that? The Gen Z's are seeking marriage again. I guess that's a good thing. But the Gen X's and neither did the millennials. They didn't seek marriage. Many of them just lived together and then split up when things didn't go well because their attitude of going into the marriage was, hey, this seems cool, let's try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll just split up. Well, as I said before, marriage never works. It doesn't. You gotta go into it with a commitment to make it work. And if you go into it thinking it's just gonna be so easy, but you're in for the shock of your life. And now, oh, get this, the social experts are telling us something that the Bible has told us for generations. You ready? The, 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 the social theorists now are telling us that couples who live together before marriage are more likely to divorce. Let me read the quote right out of Forbes. Living together prior to marriage is one predictor of the likelihood of divorce. How do you like that? Forbes goes on to tell us that 67% of all second marriages end in divorce, 73% of all third marriages end in divorce, so people who blow it the first time usually blow it the second and a third time, which means perhaps it's not that you keep choosing the wrong person or the wrong person keeps choosing you, maybe your expectations are unrealistic and you need a paradigm shift. Now, our church is passionate about giving biblical wisdom and instruction to the next generation. Wisdom can be something that you do get from the Spirit of God in prayer and devotion. But the primary way, folks, that you get wisdom is through the Word of God. He's already revealed that wisdom to you. And as you look at the Bible and look at the narratives of the Old Testament, and you look at the principles gleaned from the teachings of Jesus and the, the, and the Apostle Paul, you can get this direct instruction that can prevent so much heartache and devastation if you'll just listen. So even if you're in the room and your marriage is struggling right now, first of all, you're not alone. I, I promise you. Yeah, if you think everybody who comes to church has a perfect marriage. No, all marriages struggle to some degree. Some go through seasons of, it, of, of significant struggle. I get that. 
But the truths discovered in the Bible can not only bring healing and restoration to a marriage that's struggling, but it can also enhance and strengthen marriages that are already strong. Now, we're going to start with this over, we got we can't go down into the weeds until we get this overarching thing of marriage, love, romance, all of it. So I want to go back and remind you of this story in Genesis 29. It's a great story, and in the story we find a man by the name of Jacob. His life is a microcosm of all our lives. It's a mess. And a major reason that his life is a mess is because this thing we've talked about before called primogenitor. In primogenitor, the firstborn gets it all. The secondborn is like just an extra work hand in the field. But the firstborn man, he gets everything. He inherits three-fourths of everything. And even though he gets all of these resources, he's got an enormous amount of pressure on him because it's his job to expand the family name and the family territory. Now, I remember in Sunday school, my Sunday school teacher having this flannel board. And on that flannel board, you had Jacob and Esau, and Jacob was pulling on Esau's hill because he knew if he's not out of the womb first, he's not going to get everything. So it's almost like there was a little caption, come back in here, you little spoiled brat, get back in here. And so Jacob is living his life knowing he's second fiddle to Esau. So we read the story that the saddest part in Jacob's story actually is written in Genesis 25, 28, when the Bible tells us that Isaac, Jacob's father, loved Esau, Jacob's brother, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Favoritism has been causing a myriad of family problems since the beginning. But the mother loves Jacob, so what does she do? You know the story, she concocts a plan. Isaac is getting old and he's about to give the patriarchal blessing. Now you say, well, what difference does it make? If he wants to give Esau the blessing, so what? Doesn't matter. Remember, in this culture, words actually meant something. When you speak them, they become reality. So there was an agreement between God and Isaac. Whoever you speak the promise over, that promise will be fulfilled. And so Rebecca gets this great idea because Esau's out hunting all day and he smells like wild animals. And Jacob is in the tent learning how to cook with his mother all day, okay, because he likes the culinary life. She says, you know what, I'm gonna get you this birthright. We're gonna steal it from your father. What a horrible thing to do to her husband. So she dresses Jacob up and puts wool on his arms and his neck and probably goes down to the local 7-Eleven and buys a bottle of outdoor perfume and rubs it all over Jacob. So he smells and feels like his brother Esau. And it happens that Isaac ends up giving the firstborn blessing, which means everything to Jacob. But the byproducts are devastating. The whole episode breaks his father's heart. He's now gonna be forever separated from his mother, who's probably the only woman who's ever loved him. And Esau, his own brother's trying to kill him. The Bible tells us that he runs to a land and he finds Uncle Laban, Rebekah's brother, Jacob's uncle. And, we, and he becomes a shepherd. He's, he's tending the, the herds, which is a hard job, long hours, okay? And that's where we pick up the story. In Genesis 29, 15, we're told that Laban comes to Jacob and says, hey, because you're my kinsman, should you work for nothing? Tell me what your wages shall be. Bible says, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Man, isn't that a definitive line? I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Is any woman really worth seven years hard labor? I mean, wow. But listen, Listen, now somebody's smart. Somebody said yes because they're seated beside their wife. <laughs> the normal price that a suitor paid the family was 40 shekels. And the going rate for Jacob's work is somewhere around 1.5 shekels a month. So you do the math. He's not offering double, triple. He's offering quadruple. He's not, the, he's not haggling in a culture that is built on haggling. Verse 17 gives us a clue as to the reason. Leah's eyes were weak. But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Now, there's no easy way to say this. The Hebrew word for form is curves. We're simply being told that this is a woman who has nice curves, and she has a beautiful face. That's the Hebrew word for appearance. So Rachel is stunning. She's sexually attractive, and she's beautiful. She is lovely in form and appearance. So Jacob sees her, and he's immediately overwhelmed. How overwhelmed is he? 
In verse 11 of chapter 29, Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. You know what, I'm, you know what comes next? When's the last time your husband kissed you and just started crying? You're so beautiful, I just can't stand it. Chapter 29, verse 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Wow. Man, who can live up to that? Now, before some of you women say, man, that's what I, I if I'd have had a man like that, well, if I could just have a, no, it's not what you think. This is not the kind of love and romance that you're dreaming of. It's, it's, this is not two people taking walks on the beach and talking about the emotional state of the relationship. How do you know that, Pastor Jeff? Because look at verse 21. Give me your daughter, Rachel, that I might sleep with her. Wow. Hebrew scholars have struggled with this for years. It's utterly outrageous. It's beyond what is customary. It's uh, utterly indiscreet. It's brash. It's crass. It's everything. I just can't imagine going to Robin's father, Charlie, after I dated her for three years. Hey, give me your daughter. I want to sleep with her. That's not what you do. My time is completed. The engagement is over. Give her over. Robert Alter, who is a scholar that lives not too far from here, actually wrote a great commentary. And he says, it's very easy to understand what's going on with Jacob. Here is a man who is spiritually, emotionally, sexually overwhelmed with longing for Jacob. And he'll do absolutely anything to get her. And the question is why? Because this is the manner in which Jacob is dealing with the feelings of failure, of abandonment, of insignificance, and the unworthiness of his life. He's simply saying to himself, I'm out here in the desert. I've been rejected by my father. My life is not going the way I hoped it would go. I don't have a good relationship with mom and dad. Uh, I, my, I've broken my mother's heart. My, 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 my own brother wants to kill me. Oh, but there's Rachel. If I can just get Rachel, my life will be perfect, right? If I can just get the girl, my life will have meaning and significance. I'll be worth something. And the hole in my heart will be gone if I can just get that woman, if I can just have her in my life. Now, aren't you happy that our culture is not so archaic as to believe that sex will make our lives better? We've advanced so far, haven't we? Do you know we're now told that 70% of young men and women will have sex before they graduate high school? In today's world, it's the pinnacle, man. If you've not had sex, you're not somebody. It's the question where they ask. And in the book that I've mentioned by Ernest Becker, The Denial of Death, he says most of us, most of the human race does not want to admit the degree to which people are making sex and love paramount to make up for the lack of spiritual fulfillment in relationship with God. It's called the romantic solution. The belief that if we can find that one true love, all our feelings of insignificance, purposelessness, and meaninglessness will dissipate. So if, I have a, if I've had a horrible childhood, if I have a difficult life, or if I'm having trouble at home right now, I have this inner emptiness, and I start to think if I can just find that one person, my soulmate, my one true love, then the abuse that I suffered growing up, the sibling abuse, the feelings of nobodiness, the sense of failure, the neglect of my parents, the favoritism of, a, of my brother or sister over me, then all of this will be gone if I just find my soulmate, my one true love, my savior. And so Jacob is employing the romantic solution to his life. Rachel will be my savior. She will rescue me. She will save me. She will redeem me. Now, do you know how many times I've seen this as a pastor? A young man thinks that if he can just get the girl or have sex with the girl, that his life will have ultimate meaning. Now, the problem is if you're a Christian, not, not, the problem is probably a bad word. If you're a Christian, you know that sex before marriage is wrong. So what you do, you get married so you can have sex. And now you've done two, you've made two mistakes. Because then the Christian man gets married and it's not very long that he comes to the conclusion that wow, my wife actually has other things on her mind. Right? That the everyday pressures of life often cause a relationship to stagnate. And then when children are introduced, men Start to learn what it feels like to be a back burner item. 
And then the young woman, she wants out of the house. She wants out of the control of her parents. So her man to her represents freedom. Man, if I can just marry, oh man, I'll be living in the dream world and I will not have these restrictions. And then the children come along and her life is lived in about two bedroom space. And a marriage that begins this way is always gonna struggle because no man or no woman can live up to saviorhood. In fact, do you know what marriage is? Listen to me, young people. And if you've never been married, listen. Do you know what marriage really is? Marriage isn't saying, what is this person gonna give me? Marriage is saying, how can I enrich this person's life? And if you don't enter marriage with that question and you're expecting the other person to give you all the things you need, they will always let you down. In fact, the same article, and we're talking about secular wisdom here. The same article gave me this thing. It said three terrible reasons to get married. Okay, so here are three terrible reasons. Number one, to solve your relationship problems. Folks, your relationship problems go on warp drive after the marriage. If he's yelling at you now, it probably hits you after you're married. Because, number two, because you're afraid of being alone. Let me tell you something. If you're not happy by yourself, you're never going to be happy married. The real problem is you've not yet discovered where happiness comes from. What your significance, value, and meaning are truly tied to. You think your value as a person is determined by who you're with. You cannot be good with someone else until you are good with yourself. And you cannot be good with yourself until you are good with God. And three... To escape your present circumstances. That's a bad reason to get married. Because it'll be out of the frying pan into the fire. You say, Pastor Jeff, you're really down on marriage. No, I'm not. I love marriage. I'm almost approaching my 40th year. And my marriage, for those of you who look on stage, some of you young people look on stage because, well, what, you're old. Look at you old guy. I mean, how fun can your marriage? Let me tell you, you got no idea what you're talking about. Let me me just say something. And I'm trying to say this as gentle as I can. Let me tell you something. This sex craze culture. Let me tell you something about intimacy, okay? The more intense the love and sacrifice for each other, the better that area is. Yeah. So when you fall in deep love and you get to the point where your question is, how can I make this person's life better? Oh yeah, that's when intimacy becomes more real than it ever has been. Now, some of you young people, yeah, that sounds good. Well, you think you know everything you don't. (laughs) Now, let me show, here's the problem. There are thousands of little pseudo saviors, thousands of them, but only one real savior that can truly fill your heart and soul. And until you learn that, you're not a good candidate for marriage. Let me show you how this works in this story. So Jacob is a deceiver. Oh my goodness, he's a con artist, but he's met his match in Uncle Laban. So as soon as Jacob shows his hand too soon, as soon as he says, I will work for Rachel for seven years, Laban's evil mind goes to work because he has an unattractive daughter he's trying to unload. I'm just telling you the story. I didn't write it. (laughs) Laban is thinking, man, here's a guy who's going to do anything to get this girl. He's not negotiating. He's desperate. He's over the top. He's out of his mind. He's not thinking clearly. So how does Laban respond to Jacob's offer? I'll tell you what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, done deal, seven years and you got her. Let's shake hands, good idea. No, verse nine, Laban said, well, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Man, that is a useless statement. That's a salesman statement. It's oblique, it is positive, but basically there's no commitment to it. But Jacob, because he's out of his mind, here's what he wants to hear. So he works seven hard years. And then he goes to Uncle Laban and says, all right, give me my wife. You know the rest of the story? It's kind of sad. You don't have to have a lot of historical or archaeological or philosophical knowledge to understand what happens next. Laban says, okay. So you have the big day of celebration. You know, you got the parade, the blowing on the shofar. You got a lot of wine, a lot of drinking all day long. And the veil in those times, sorry, the bride in those times remained veil until the evening. So you don't get to see them all day during the parade, during the shofar, during the drinking and feasting. You don't get to see the bride. They are heavily veiled. And evidently Leah and Rachel had similar bills, somewhat, or the wine, who knows. And then they go into the tent to consummate the marriage. 
Of course, you don't have, you don't flip the light switch on, no light, no electricity, and there's been a lot of wine. And Jacob says, oh, Rachel, and in the morning he realizes it's Leah. He is livid because Uncle Laban has sneaked Leah into the tent. Now, I'll talk more about that in a second. When that happens, Jacob is livid. Oh, man, he's so, and look at the, think about the irony here. He goes to Uncle Laban and he says, what have you done? You've deceived me. You know for what and for whom I was working. And Laban's response is this. Basically, literally in the Hebrew, it says, well, around here, it's not the custom to put the younger before the older. Oh, my boy. Uncle Laban's been talking to somebody. Jacob doesn't even argue. He just goes away, walks away. And it's because I think suddenly a spear goes through Jacob's conscience and explodes. Because the minute Laban used the word deceived, it's the same Hebrew word that Isaac used when he said, Jacob, why have you deceived me? And then when he adds around here, it's not the custom of the younger to be preferred over the older. It, it could have been rapid fire. It dawns on him, Laban is doing the same thing to me that I did to my father. My father reached out in the dark thinking it was Esau and it was Jacob. I reached out in the dark thinking it was Rachel, but it was Leah. Now, take a good look at verse 17. The biblical narrative is outstanding. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and very beautiful. What does that mean, weak eyes? Does it mean that, that Rachel could see a long way, but Leah is cross-eyed and couldn't see very far? <laughs> no, it actually means, it, in, in this context, to say that someone, the beauty was in the eyes. And if you were beautiful, the eyes would draw you in, compel you. So it's, it's the Bible's way of saying that Leah, there was nothing about her that was compelling. Now, you think about this for a moment. What would it be like to grow up in the shadow of a beautiful, stunning sister, and you're the ugly duckling? You think about how bad this really is. Even her own father's trying to unload her. Man, how would that make you feel? Her own father rejects her, looks right through her, has ignored her for years, and now he wants to offload her onto someone else. However... And I just, I, you know, reading through the text again and trying to understand some things, something dawned on me. She didn't have to go into the tent. No, there would be nothing in the culture, nothing at all that would have forced her to go into the tent. She wanted to go. Why? Because she's trying to deal with a hole in her heart the same way Jacob's trying to deal with his. She has a pseudo savior in Jacob. She's thinking, man, if I can just get this guy, if I can get Jacob, just like Jacob is thinking, if I can get Rachel. And she longs for Jacob because she thinks it's going to give her purpose and meaning. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make everything okay. And then suddenly, if you look at the story, you can tell that she's thinking, if I just give him some children, which was a pretty big deal in those days, he'll love me. And every day... Of course, we'd never do that again. We'd never do that again. We'd never say, I'm going to have babies so my husband will stay with me. I'm so glad we're removed from that. So every day she sees the man she's, she most longs for in the arms of the one in whose shadow she's lived all of her life. Now, to try to get Jacob's attention, she starts having babies and she gives them interesting names. So the first child is Reuben, which means to see. Maybe now I'll be visible to my husband. That doesn't work. So she has Simeon, which means to hear. Maybe now my husband will listen to me. And then she has Levi, which means to attach. Now maybe, maybe my husband will attach himself to me like a husband should attach himself to his wife and forget about this Rachel character. She's handling the emptiness and the hole in her life by hoping Jacob would be her savior. If only this man will love me, I'll be somebody, I'll be visible, I'll have a family, I'll have children, I'll matter. But once again, pseudo-savior. One of the things that concerns me about the generation we're in now is, and I like to remind young people, there are two massive dangers. And we already mentioned one, for a, for a man to look upon a girl and think, man, if I can just marry this girl and sleep with this girl and have her for the rest of my life, man, my life will be complete. But there's also something from the other side, and I'm listening to more and more young women describe a husband as if all he is is a baby daddy. I just need a producer because what I really want is children. He'll do. You think about those two people coming together in marriage. One thinks, oh, I'm going to have sex for the rest of my life anytime. 
And you know, in marriage, it doesn't work like that. And the other is thinking, I need a baby daddy, somebody who just puts the kids to bed at night. I don't have to really spend time with them and work on the marriage. Man, how long is that going to last? Let me tell you, about eight years. <laughs> no matter who we are, in all of life, in every aspect of life, there is, also, there is always a ground note of discontentment running through our lives. And no matter how much health or wealth, whatever it is we try to fill the void with, it will only work maybe for a short time, but ultimately it will leave you more unfulfilled than you were previously. Nobody said this letter better than C.S. Lewis when he said, most people, if they really learned how to look into their own hearts, would know that they want something this world could never give them. These are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning will ever satisfy. There is always something that we have grasped at the first moment of longing that just fades away with reality. The thing we thought we were going to get in the new experience always evades us. So I hope that you're listening to me, those of you who are in the audience who are young and not married, those middle-aged and want to be married, and those who are older and you want to be married. I hope you listen to this. You think, you think your real problem, this feeling, these things that you're having, is that you're alone, and it's not. Your real problem is, even though you love Jesus and you understand the gospel, you've not yet learned that everything you really truly need is in him. And let me tell you, if you're a Christ follower and you love God, let me tell you, God does love you. And you're waiting for God to bring the man or the girl along, but you're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. And when he, realize, when he thinks you're ready, if you're a Christ follower, he cares. If he thinks you're ready, then I believe he'll give you the desires of your heart. But the desire of your heart ultimately should be God. This is such a recipe for disaster because when you have two people coming into a relationship, both are flawed, both have problems, and when both, when each expects the other to save them, it's going to last about eight years. Now, thank God. You know who the hero of this story is? For years, I thought it was Jacob, Uncle Laban, Isaac. No, the hero of this whole narrative is Leah. Leah. Because something happens to her in the midst of all this where she realizes that these decisions that she made, it's not helping, so she starts to get down on her knees and cry out to God. In fact, scholars, are, they, they're trying to figure out why she uses the covenant name of God, a name that you'd expect Isaac, Moses, this covenant, this intimacy. She doesn't use the more generic name of Elohim. She keeps referring to God as Yahweh. And the reason scholars tell us is because she's, she's got intimacy with God because she's been crying out to God. She's learning who God really is. And somewhere along the line, because she's discovered who God really is, even though she's elevated family to a pseudo-savior, at the same time, she's craving intimacy with God. So by the time she has her fourth child, there's a breakthrough. In Genesis 29, 35, she has a child named Judah, which means praise. This time, I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. And then the Bible says she stopped having kids. She took the most... Deepest, deepest passionate desires of her heart took them away from her husband and put them onto the Lord. Now, what are we to learn? Remember what I said when we started? Be patient. How many applications can you think of so far? Be patient. Number one, there's a void in you that only Christ can fill. If, if, this, even, this isn't even a marriage point. This is just your life, Okay. There is a void in you that only Christ can fill. You will never find your rest until you find your rest in Jesus. Now, how many of us, we've heard that all of our lives. What does that mean? What does it mean? In Psalm 139, there's a beautiful passage. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my de bed in the depths, you're there. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know full well. I love this because there are two beautiful Hebrew words translated fearfully and wonderfully. And the Hebrew word translated fearfully is the same word we have in English as awesome, okay? 
And the Hebrew word tra uh, translated wonderfully is actually a word that means intricate, detail. So what the Bible says is God knows who you are because he made you. All your talents and temperaments and abilities. I mean, he puts you together piece by piece. That's what wonderfully made means. And when you operate in how he made you to operate and stop trying to be something you're not, then people will stand back and say, you're awesome. That's how you become awesome is when you put together everything that God put together and you start to realize that he sees when you leave, he sees when you come near, he sees when you're sleeping, he sees when you're awake. He's, his eyes are always on you. And as a result, he has made you for a reason. Now, when you come to terms with man, my meaning, my significance, my purpose, all found in God, then you're, you're a great candidate for marriage because you don't expect the other person to give you those things. And now your expectations are realistic. And now the two of you come together in mutual submission and mutual desire to help each other achieve the very best person you can become under the love of God. You cannot be good with someone else until you are good with yourself. And you cannot be good with yourself until you are good with God. And you will never find yourself in another person. You, you can't find ultimate things in people who aren't ultimate. Only God is ultimate, and that's where you will find what you're looking for. So there's a void in you that only Christ can fill. And by the way, God has been courting you all your life. You know that, right? I had a friend in New Zealand once say to me, Pastor Jeff, there's just so much bad in the world to believe in God. And I said, well, can I ask you something? And I won't go through the whole spiel. I said, do you think there's any good in the world? He goes, yeah. I said, well, name a few things, you know. And we, we first, you know, it was a long conversation, but things like, you know, the mountain, the oceans, love, relationships, chocolate, coffee. I said, well, do you, do you deserve those things? Now you think about, do you de why do you deserve to have any good thing in your life? He couldn't answer it. See, isn't it amazing? Yeah, there are bad things in the world. And that's another conversation, but there's so much good. You know, food, why does it have to taste good? I mean, if God just wanted us to be resource, why don't just... I don't know, hook up to something, put it in, but no taste, no enjoyment, no nothing. There's so much in the world that he made. Nature, sunshine, rain, all of those things. Even in the hard times that we have, there's a yearning for something more. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he's made everything beautiful in its time, and he said eternity in the hearts of men. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The point is, in the words of Blaise Pascal, if you wonder who said this first, Probably not first, but at least in, this, in, in these terms. There is a God-shaped void in you that only God can fill. And he's been courting you all your life to compel you. God has strong eyes to compel you into a relationship with him so that you can be good in your relationships with everybody else. And until you understand that, you're going to try to fill the void in your life the other three ways. You're either going to try the creative solution. You're going to separate yourself from the herd and prove to the world that you matter. Rising above will give you a sense of, of, of being substantial. Or you're going to try the religious solution to where you tell everybody or show everybody how pious and righteous you are. So somehow that'll give you some sense of meaning. Or you're going to try what most people try, the romantic solution, which is the most powerful solution. It's what we do in the absence of a good and perfect relationship with God. It may never be perfect, but in the absence of the relationship with God that we should have, we go out and we think we're going to find our soulmate, the romantic solution that will make our lives complete. They will not. There's only one that can make your life complete, and that is Christ. There is a void in you that only Christ can fill quickly. Your spouse will lead you away from God or toward God. Now we're getting into something. All right, we're going to play a little true and false game. Now, this is the end. I need you to stick with me here. True or false, divorce rates of Christians are similar to those of the general population. True or false? True, misleading, but true. Now, here's the second statement. Heavily religious and evangelical people have a lower divorce rate than the general public. That is true. See, when you hear that divorce rates among Christians are similar to the general population, the way they determine that is anybody who calls themselves a Christian. But not everything that glitters is gold. But what they know now is that people who are serious about their faith, heavily religious people, go to church, worship, are in community groups. Evangelical people have a 
significantly lower divorce rate than the general public. Now, here's the third one, true or false. Moderately to lightly religious people have a higher rate of divorce. True. You see what this says? The highest group of divorce is the group that plays religion but really doesn't have a personal relationship with God. Nominal Christianity in name only. I, you know how many times I've heard a lady come to me, I tried it God's way. I said, what do you mean? Well, I met him at church. <laughs> he prayed with me once. We had a church wedding. And I don't know how many of you watched the show Frasier, but in the words of Grandpa Willie, a cat can have kittens in the oven, but that don't make them biscuits. <laughs> I happen to like that. Just because somebody calls themselves a Christ follower doesn't mean that they are. There was a guy, uh, when I, and I've shared this story, I was dating a girl. I dated a girl for four years before I met the love of my life, Robin. And I thank God for his grace of getting me out of this relationship. Because I ne never would have met Robin. But I dated a girl. One of my Christian friends came to me. And I told you that my parents told me, what are you doing with this girl? And all my friends said, what are you doing with this girl? And finally, a friend that I really respected came to me and said, hey, you know what PDA is, don't you? Public display of affection. You need to talk about PDU. I said, what's PDU? Priorities, disciplines, and ultimate pursuits. Think about your girlfriend. What are her priorities? Well, I knew what it was. Her, everything on the exterior. What are her disciplines? There are none. What are her ultimate pursuits? Money. So after he got me to open up into this, he thought, and this is the girl you want to marry. You know, women in second marriages who are Christians, they're notorious for this. They're, they become desperate because they're afraid they're going to be alone. So they think just because they meet somebody at church, it's got to be the right guy. Hey, do you want me to tell you, hey, you want me to give you a little secret? This is going to come later. Here's a question you can ask your husband or the person that you're dating in church. Here's the question you can ask them. Now, you're not going to like this, but here's the, here's the question you can ask them to know if they at least make the second cut. Here's how you know they're at least serious about their faith. You ready? Ask him if he's tithing. Can I get an amen, Michael? What women want more than anything else is to live life with a man who's living for a purpose greater than himself. There's a void in you that only Christ can fill. Your spouse will lead you either away from God or toward God. There's no middle ground. And third and quickly, troubled marriages are redeemable. And this is the hope I want to leave you as we go forward. No matter, I've never met a marriage or seen a marriage yet that was not redeemable. Now, some take a lot more work than others. I'm a, I, can I give you two little nuggets here? Okay, and these are important. Number one, two nuggets. Grow in love for the Lord. If your marriage is in trouble, Lean into your relationship with Jesus. Don't lean into complaining about your marriage. Stop expecting your spouse to give you what only Christ can give you. Fix that first. I know that you want what everybody else wants, a love that is unconditional, sacrificial, relentless, patient, and kind. That's what we all want. And I'm telling you, there's only one place you're going to get it, and that's with Jesus. And as you lean into the spiritual disciplines of Scripture and memorization and prayer and worship, and you meet the God who's able to fill your heart and soul with every good thing, then and only then will you start to see your husband or wife through the eyes of God. And something amazing will happen. You'll start having gratitude for their strengths and grace and mercy for their weaknesses. That's not the cure-all, and I know it's far more complex. This is only the beginning. And second, grow in your love for one another. But in the same way, listen now, this is the end. In the same way there are spiritual disciplines that grow your love for God, there are also disciplines that grow your love for each other. Three quick ones. Number one, return to the courtship mentality. If your marriage is in trouble, start courting each other again. Because, man, you were so good before the marriage. Think about the things you did before marriage. Remember how you served and sacrificed? Stop, you know, go right back to that. I, used to, I tell the story that when Robin and I were dating and we had some of those thunderstorms in Tennessee, I would, man, I would pull the car up to wherever we were going, restaurant, cafe, or the house, and I would lock the door in the car, or sorry, I would unlock the door in the car, I'd run around and I'd have the umbrella. I didn't want one drop of water to get on her head, not one. And now I get out of the car, run to the house, look through the window. I wonder if she's coming, right? 
We're, go, we're in the airport. When we were traveling with missing teams and everything, I carried all the luggage to show her what a man I was. I had her luggage, my luggage. And now, <clears throat> and now we go to the airport and I got my luggage and I'm thinking, are you coming, man? Come on. <laughs> go back to, tre- that's a good start. Treasure, front burner. Two, learn the person's love language. <clears throat> it's so important if you've not read uh, the five love languages, learn the love language and speak it often. It is powerful. It is powerful. And third, be together. And this is, the, this is how I want to leave you because when the kids come, I notice in this younger generation, the husband and the wife, they kind of shut down and go start living their own lives and that's a recipe for disaster. You've got to have somebody invest in your marriage the way Robin and I did. Every Thursday night when we had kids, there was a lady who came over and would babysit and I would have date night with Robin and I would ask her three questions. Number one, how are we doing? Number two, what do you need from me that you're not getting? And number three, what are your hopes and dreams? And when you ask your wife that question every Thursday, don't go to a movie, that's not a date. Go have coffee, go to dinner and talk. And men, let me give you a warning. The first time you do this, oh my goodness, you're gonna get it. I just want, if you haven't done this in a while, you you sit there and take it like a man, all right? Take it, because you haven't asked in a while. And she's gonna probably tell you everything that's wrong with you. And that's a long list for most of us. Let her do it invest. <clears throat> and that's how you start. And what I really want to say is if that, if, if this makes you sick, if you heard that and you're saying, man, no, I'm going to forget it. What he's no way, man, I'm not taking her to dinner. She's been so mean, forget it. And you're saying, I don't want him to take me to, then it's done. If you're there, it's done. No grace, no mercy. If you're not willing to put the time in marriages, don't just heal themselves. This is the beginning. So what's the overarching truth now that I've gone so far over? Don't expect from a husband or a wife what only God can give you. Get yourself right with God. Go deep into God. And when you go deep into God and he knows that you're ready, then trust him to send the right one along. And let me tell you something. For some of you, you have a call to a single life. Do you know that? There's a call to singleness. Now, we'll touch on that later, but I truly believe that for some of you, God's calling on your life is to be single. How could he do that to me? (laughs) And some of you are saying, thank God he's saving me from all this stuff. (laughs) There is a call. God has a plan. Singleness is not sinful. Singleness is not evil. Singleness can be a great thing if it's the calling of God on your life. Father, uh, difficult topic, and you know that, especially now more than ever, I pray that anything I've said that is not consistent with your word that would be trampled on and forgotten, anything I've said that is consistent with your truth, what marriage is, who we're to be, go down deep into our lives. And I pray a special prayer. First of all, I pray for all the young singles that hope to be married, that Father, they would get right with you first, get healthy in a relationship with you and that would give them the wisdom to choose wisely. Father, I pray for those who are in a marriage that's very difficult right now. I pray, God, would you remind them that there's hope? There's always hope. If two people want to come together, there can be forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration. And Father, I pray for those who maybe have been married a few times, and, but they want to be married again. Then, Father, I pray the same prayer. That as they lean into you, you would give them insight, give them comfort and lead them and guide them along the way so that they may be ready when you're ready for them to once again experience this wonderful thing called marriage. In Christ's name, everybody said, amen. So I wonder, I wonder if you'd stand with me right now and I'm gonna ask uh, on all our campuses. So at Rancho, would you stand and Over at Upland, would you stand as well? And West Co, we're all gonna do this together. Would you stand as well? And then all our prayer counselors and decision counselors, would you come forward on every campus, San Dimas, over at Upland, Rancho, West Co. Because I said in the beginning that the thing, the beautiful thing about a marriage series is that you learn so much about the character and nature of God and about love. And some of you, you know, you've never, you, God is a theory to you, but he's never been intimate. 
He's never been intimately close, especially for us guys, because we're tough. You know, we're tough. We go to church because it's the right thing to do. But without intimacy, closeness with God, you're never going to know what it's like to have your heart filled with the things that you're so desperately searching for that you try to get through your job or through a romance or through even religion itself. Thomas Aquinas said, I love this. When A loves B and B refuses to love A, A hurts. A hurts because he's lost something. But when God loves me and I refuse to love God, God hurts too, but not because he's lost something, but because I've lost something. What have I lost? Well, at the cross of Jesus, you find your ultimate significance. That God has all the goods on you and loves you enough to send his own son to forgive you of your sins. You have the religious solution in that you don't have to work and earn salvation. It's been provided for you on the cross. And you have the ultimate romantic solution is God loves you so much that he gave up what he treasured most so that he would not lose you. And so your first step toward all of this is to give your life over to Jesus. And I'm asking you that if you're in this room, and first of all, you've never become a Christian. If you're at Upland, if you're at Rancho, if you're at West Coast, and you're in this room, and you've never given your life to Jesus, do it now, as we sing. Come forward, give your life to Jesus. But if you've been a Christian for a long time, and when I talk about love and intimacy, and you've really, there's no feeling, there's no emotion, there's nothing in you that kind of oh, longs for God. You don't pant for God or his word in the morning. There's nothing in you. There's a spiritual disconnect. Man, you need somebody to pray for you and pray in Jesus' name that you get a revelation of God himself. And you pray that God would give you an understanding of this intimacy and would come into your life and live that, and you would live your life this way in this deep, intimate relationship with God. And sometimes that can happen just through the prayer of somebody who calls down the power of the Spirit in you and suddenly your eyes are open. That's what you're praying. You're praying that I would wake up and give my life to Christ. And for the rest of us, if you know God and you've experienced God and you know what intimacy with God is like, man, as we sing, you should be dancing and running around, but don't do it. You can dance, but no running around. Okay, Father, we pray for your spirit to descend on this place, that you would be glorified and that there would be life change today. That somebody who's been far from God would come home and those who are looking for love, something's missing, there's a void and they don't know how to feel it. They've tried everything. Give them the courage to walk out the aisle and come and have someone pray. And then we pray that the power of your spirit would descend on this place and they would receive a Jesus revelation that they've never seen before and they would come home. In Christ's name, everybody said. Yes, Jesus, you are our heart's desire. I don't want it.
Jesus, that's our prayer tonight, Lord. Lord, we don't want anything other than you. We just want deeper intimacy with you, Jesus. To love you, to really know you. To live every single second of our days abiding in you, Jesus. You are our heart's desire, Lord. We love you so deeply and we just want more of you, Jesus. Let's sing, give me Jesus one more time. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world, one more time, give Good. 
fall asleep All my life you have been faithful Yes, Jesus And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God us in worship in heaven one day. They're so good. Thank you guys. We love you. You're the best. Is God good to you? Are you sure? Are you sure? Amen. Please be seated. We're going to continue worship by taking our tithes and offering and giving them to God. I was reading Genesis 12 and in that passage it's interesting because God tells Abraham, hey, uh, come, I'm going to take you to this land and I'm, I'm going to show you this, this piece of land is going to be for your descendants. And Abraham does something amazing. He builds an altar and sacrifices to the Lord. Even before the promise was fulfilled. Did you catch that? Anybody catch that? He built an altar thanking God. God didn't have to choose Abraham. He didn't have to choose you and me. But He chose you and me. Amen. He died for you. He did something unexpected for you. And what is our return? Is what? Worship, praise, thanksgiving. And that's what tithes and offerings are. Thanksgiving and praise for God's unexpected provision in our lives. Amen. And if you're giving towards the West Cove uh, building, uh, the, uh, the deadline is June 30th. I wanted to put that out there for you, okay? So as you give, put that in your mind. The ash is going to come forward. And as we give, let's see what's happening at our church. Hey, if you were here for Easter, you got to see an incredible story about a woman named Janice and how she turned to God in the midst of a tragedy. We know that you also might have a story that can encourage others. So we would love to hear more about it. You can go to oneandall.church slash story, share your story and help encourage the church. If you're looking to jumpstart your relationship with God, we have an incredible resource for you. It's called The Daily, and it's a podcast style devotional designed to help you get into scripture every day. We love having it on our app, and it's great because you can not only listen to the devotional, but you can also dive into prayer and a reflection time with our One and All community. If you don't have the One and All app, go ahead and download it. I also like to listen to the daily on my way to work because it's on Spotify, so that works for me too. However you like to listen to podcasts, make sure to check out the daily, and we would love to have that as a resource to help you grow. This week, we have two great opportunities to join together with our church family in prayer. On Tuesday, we have a women's prayer night at 6.30 at the San Dimas campus. And Wednesday, we have men's prayer night at 7 p.m. at our Rancho campus. To find out more details about these events, you can find them on our One and All app. Just open the One and All app, scroll down to events, click on that, and you'll find out about our prayer nights and other things we have going on here at One and All. Our passion is seeing you grow and seeing those who are far from God come near. Thank you for being a part of that here at One and All. Yes, good things happening at our church. Would you please stand to your feet? 
Hey, if you're new here, you've been here once, this is your first time, your third time, your sixth time, and you want to get connected, I'm going to be in there. Pastor Marissa is going to be there. Katrina is going to be there. Would love to meet you and help you get connected and answer any questions that you may have. Now, next week, don't forget, invite someone back for as we continue our series, how to fix your marriage and make it better. But now, as you live, remember, if God is for you, who can be against you? One hope and one life. God bless everybody.